here is singer-songwriter, broadcaster, audio-video artist, entertainment agent, and your host for the Dharmic Evolution. It's the master storyteller himself, James Kevin O'Connor. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharmic Evolution. We've got an old friend coming by today. Uh, This man, he's a world maestro. He's the only world maestro we've ever had on this show. So for over two decades, this man has been composing and performing internationally. His passion for creating music started early in life. When barely a teenager, at 14, he began studying with Rich Thompson at the Eastman School of Music. From there, he attended the University of Arizona on scholarship to earn a degree in jazz performance. Maybe that's why he's back in Arizona today. And even though he performs on a variety of traditional and cultural international musical instruments and has even been known to sing occasionally, at heart, he'll always be a percussionist, which is where his musical journey began. His range of musical styles spans from several electronic compositions for television to ensembles with cultural themes to classical music for international orchestras. You better strap up your seatbelts because we're taking a ride today on the Dharmic Evolution with Colin O'Donohoe. Welcome to Dharmic Evolution, Colin. It's been a few years. Yeah, when, when was it that we were... It was like the first. three and a half years ago. You were like episode number six. Yeah, I thought I was one of your first uh, shows yeah, there. Yeah, you were. And I went and listened to it, and I was actually so impressed. Not with myself, but, I mean, we got into some, some <laughs> great, great <laughs> conversations Humble. to the point that uh, I had to send it out so, to some dear friends because uh, <laughs> the content was so rich. I mean, we you got into talking about all kinds of interesting time signatures Things that nobody uses and, uh, you know, not many people use anyway, at least in this country. So tell me, catch me up a little bit on, um, first of all, your personal life. Your kids have grown. You've got four children, if I remember correctly. I do have four children. Absolutely unbelievable. And how do you look so good for having four kids at all different ages? (laughs) I think I started young. So I feel I'm still young. Yeah. And the kids are awesome. I mean, kids give you life right back to you, you know, what you give. Uh, so maybe they're the reason I'm staying young. It is so true. I feel the same way. It's, uh, you know, my what my younger son is a singer-songwriter, and he, he works out of Austin, Texas now, and um, cool. he's a phenomenal talent. But he keeps me, like, up to date on what's, like, really happening in the things yeah. that are off the mainstream media, like the, the, like the really cool stuff I get from him, you know, all the time. So you're right, the the kids do keep you um, grounded and young. So uh, where do you want to start? You're in uh, Phoenix now, you were in New York, and you split your time between Turkey and where else? (laughs) Sure, so yes, uh, I guess three and a half years ago, I was living in Manhattan. Uh, Since then, I had moved a little bit, but currently I split my time between United States and Turkey. Uh, two years ago, I began living in Turkey about 60-70% of the year, and America less. Um, and so I've, I've been doing that now two years. Uh, and this year, I'll be going after the end of August, early September, I'll be going to Asia and studying with some musicians in Tokyo, and then Seoul, and then in Mongolia. And then after that, I'll head back to Turkey, and then I'm sure I'll be back here by Christmas. So awesome. travel quite a bit. Yeah. So have you picked up on the Turkish language or are you just in and out too much to, you know? No, no. I've over the last two years, I spent a lot of time there just in Turkey. So, yes, I I went there learning or actually knowing maybe a a tiny, tiny uh, little bit of uh, Turkish. And since then, I've become at least conversationally fluent. Um, I engaged and there was an engagement party in, in Bursa. And that was a lot of Turkish and important Turkish. It's your life. You know, you're getting yeah. married. It's kind of an important deal. So it's good to understand what's going on. So uh, I was able to carry myself through that. And I, I don't know, I make it through day-to-day uh, stuff with my language. So it's good enough. But it needs to be better. Yeah. yeah. So for people who don't know, um, 
uh, what Colin does. And of course, you know, we, we talked about uh, that at the outset when I gave you his bio and everything, but the Pangean or- Orchestra, which is a big part of your life. And um, it's such a massive undertaking. And, you know, every time I look at what you're doing, I'm, I'm just can, kind of in awe of like, you know, putting all these pieces together and managing it. And, and I know you have people helping you now and it's grown quite a bit. So can you tell us where you are with Pangean in the journey right now as far as, um, you know, what's been going on as far as where are you playing and how are the performances going and how do you, how do you see this thing growing and continuing on its journey? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so right now, Today, uh, we're in about the last 10, 12 days of a fundraiser, a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, The goal of that was to get enough uh, money together to become fully incorporated as a 501c3. And in addition to that, have the money to secure a couple of performances, both in America and in Turkey. Uh, Currently, we have raised enough money to at least uh, incorporate and and become the 501c3 pride by the end of the year and look for some alternative uh, funding sources so that we can do some shows. Uh, there's a bit of a satellite uh, group now in Istanbul. Um, I, I don't know what the best term, but it, like a branch, I suppose, of Pangean is in Istanbul. Uh, we had one in Manhattan as well. And then here in Phoenix, the original place, there's still a lot of us, you know, getting together. We had a big show last month. We had one this morning where we played with an African group for international students at Arizona State, which was very well attended. A couple thousand people were there for that. And, you know, we're, I don't know, we're in a transition maybe of becoming that fully established company now um, and then being able to put a season together. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. So what do you see as far as... Yeah, as far as like your perfect vision for this um, and, you know, the fact that you have like different, you know, it's starting to reach out and you're having like different branches, which is just great. I mean, do you see like other orchestra leaders uh, participating in this or are you going to be at the forefront of the Pangean Orchestra for at least, you know, not, not in perpetuity, obviously, um, you're, you're going to die at some point, like, just, just like I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for cheering me up this morning, man. I, this is what I do, Colin. Uh, you're it's Irish, like, I guess. And we haven't even gone out for a pint yet, so it's yeah. like... <laughs> oh, man. But, I mean, your vision is like, you know, you can't be all things to all people. I mean, you're doing so much. Yeah. Do you see this as going out as the Pangean Orchestra you know, it just originates from one spot and it moves from place to place, or will there be several Pangean orchestras at some point that have this, you know, model out there? Yeah. So I think what, you know, what you're referring to, I, I think um, if I'm understanding you correctly. So the idea of the Pangean orchestra is to really, as much as one can combine the ideas, not only the instrument of a place in South Southern Asia or in the Middle East or Europe, not just to take these really cool special instruments, but also the ideas that that instrument's tradition has with it, uh, the musicians, the the repertoire, all of that. And with that comes a very distinct perspective on music, how you hear, uh, what things are beautiful to you, what things are dissonant to you. And so uh, I guess as a contrast to some of the other I guess, world music movements where, the, where they're trying to bring people together. I'm not trying to do a Western music imperialism kind of thing where we're going to go around and, and play a pop song, but we're going to play it in Swahili or we're going to play it in Chinese, but it's an American pop song. I, I'm pretty sensitive to that because there's a very uh, strong influence, Western influence anyway, in all parts of the world. And I love American music and and country and hip hop and everything. But I also love the music of these other countries. And what I don't want is me to get to say Japan, or to Mongolia, or in Turkey, and I'm bringing American music and I tell them, well, you can be cool and popular, if you play my style of music. And then that kind of it influences their music in a very negative way. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is get a, a more communal thing. So that means that I can't be the only person that would lead it. 
you need people that have been brought up, you know, in the traditions of like Sri Lanka or somewhere else. And they don't have uh, what I had growing up. I grew up listening to Irish music and uh, rock and roll and, you know, folk music of the 60s and stuff. So I have my perspective and I need to be conscious of that, that I have a bias and then bring in other people that hear music totally different. Uh, that's the idea behind Pangean. And I think if we can get some other leaders and they're just as strong and they're like, yeah, we should do it this way or this way, then we're going to get some music that no one could have thought of yet because you're combining all these cool instruments and we're not having to play a one, four, five chord progression. We can play whatever. Yeah. So do you feel like you guys, like that you may um, curve fit the sets, like customize the, the sets or the selection of music in such a way that if you're playing like one performance in, in Eastern Asia and then two weeks later you're playing in the south of France, would you, would, you, um, would you adjust your set and your music accordingly because of the, you know, the different cultures? So I think the cool thing about our shows is there are parts that can be taken out yeah. and you plug in something. So we would do a little of both. And we have almost always done that. So we'll have one that might feature the music of Iran. We might have another show sometime that does the music of Japan. And while we do it as a whole group, we'll have moments in the show where it's just the musicians from that area playing it the way it would sound in that part of the world. So, you know, whether you're in France or whether you're in uh, China or wherever, or even just five shows in America, you know, we can spotlight different parts of the world, like Brazil sometime, and then Ireland, another. Uh, so absolutely. The other thing about traveling, uh, when we get to do that as a group, we can bring a core group of the Pangean and then utilize the talent that's in somewhere else uh, and play their music. And we're learning from them just as much as they would be learning from us. And I think that is a really exciting idea. Um, that's something I really want to do. I want to play uh, this first track for everybody, and I'm going to take a swing at, at trying to pronounce it, and don't laugh yet. Mahmoudihi. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> you no. laugh. You laugh. He's, I asked you not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so horrible. <laughs> I knew it would be. So, so give, us, give us the title of this first one. No, it wasn't that bad. No, I guess part of the surprise is it's, it's the last name of the man who, it's an improvisation. Uh, from a Persian man named Saman Mahmoudi. Mahmoudi, and, uh, okay. Yeah, so it wasn't really that bad. I guess it just surprised me. Like, hey, I'm not the only one with a really strong American <laughs> accent. <thing. laughs> you actually okay. made me feel good. Yeah, well, we're going to play this one, and then I, I want to talk about it uh, after that. So everybody, Mahmoudi, here it is. Let 
Obviously, a live performance there, and uh, so give us the story on that. How that that piece was constructed, and you know what was the um, the motivation behind this, or the the inspiration behind creating this piece of music. Well, that particular piece I didn't create. Uh, the it's the composer and the performer. His name is Saman Makmudi. Uh, he did that. It's in a Persian classical style. It's in a. a uh, Daska that's very similar to F major, and uh, they but they have some extra notes. For instance, they have an E sharp, uh, which you know we if if an American read E sharp, they would think he meant F. Yes, uh, but they don't. They mean E sharp. They mean that space between E and F. You know, right. think back to when you're learning clarinet. And you were in that space, not on purpose, but you were there, guaranteed. Right. <laughs> uh, it's that, you know, you're just playing an F very flat, you're playing an E really sharp. It's that space. So there are a few little uh, nuances, colors, and the more you s time you spend in that music, uh, whether it's from Iran or Iraq, Turkey, you do begin to see those colors or hear them in, in your ear just the way you would hear uh, a perfect fifth or an octave or whatever, you'll start to hear that, that pitch and identify it. Uh, it becomes, it's so difficult. Um, I don't, I'm guessing most of your listeners would be Western, have Western ears. I mean, they're speaking English uh, since they're listening to this. It's very hard when you listen to that piece to know exactly what they're doing. It does sound very foreign, but there's some very distinct rules. Uh, these come from, thousands of years of tradition. And this man who's performing it is exceptionally talented and he does it so well and he does it so easily. And if he explained it to you, he would just say, what? It's just F major. It's just me improvising an F major right. uh, because he takes for granted the things that he, he just knows intrinsically just. So why would there. he say, why wouldn't he say E sharp though? Oh, he does. He'll call oh. it E-sharp. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I need the fretless bass to do that. You can't do it on yeah. guitar, you know? <laughs> but he would say it like this, like, what? It's just F major with an E-sharp. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we would be, wait, 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 what? What was that last thing you said? What? Yeah. It kind of goes against the grain of what we're taught, I guess, in, 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 in you know, in American music. You know, you just don't use E-sharp. 
you know. No, so. I mean, your teachers scold you and tell you not to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They'll, you know, they'll smack you with a ruler, make you move that hand on the fret just a little bit further up or down. Yeah. To get rid of that note. And you at home playing with your favorite records, you'll do the same. Oh, whoops. I missed it. Yeah. You know, and you'll move it. And it sounds bad to us. And that was something I was bringing up with when you have different leaders or you have different people. What I've learned through doing Pangean is beauty, you know, in one culture is not beauty in the other culture. And that something that's ugly to us is not ugly to them. So you and I would hear that E sharp and want to fix it in the studio right. with, with some gadgets and logic, right? But they would want to enhance that. They would say, that's the perfect part. That's the most beautiful note in the whole, whole melody. And make it stand and out. Trying, and we would, be, we would be getting rid of it. So... Isn't that something how your ear gets like, you know, what's ear candy to one is like, you know, nails on a blackboard to someone else. It's just because of that's what you've been taught or used to, I guess. Yeah, I know I felt it in my own career. I don't know if you've felt it, but especially with music as a, the things that you love when you're 12 and 13 and 14 and you think are the absolute coolest. If you listen to it 15 years later spending your career in music, then you start to think, huh, it's still a cool song. It's still fun, but it sounds more empty. You're missing some of the color notes that you've begun to love uh, yeah. as a more uh, older musician. I've noticed that once I start playing chords with nines in them and flat nines and just extensions, and then I start to listen to music that doesn't have it, my ear has to adjust, you know, go back to, oh, these are power chords. Nothing wrong with a power chord. They're great. Yeah. But it's, it just sounds empty now right. when it used to sound full. Um, yeah. Do you have perfect pitch? No, 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 okay. no. Uh -uh. So you I have great relative pitch. Yeah. If someone tells me that note's a G, then I'm good. But no, right. I, I think I have the same thing, but I think, I think my ears have gotten better um, through the years. I think the more I expand my musical world, they seem to get more sensitive to tunings and, and things that I hear that are, you know, not sitting right. You know, I can tell if something's out of tune, even if it's like everyone else in the room is like, this is great. And I'm like, I wish they tuned their guitar. You know, it's like. Yeah, we become the weird ones, right? Yeah. Like, oh, it's, oh and everyone it. else is happy and we're, you know, kind of twitching and stuff. Yeah. I think it's when you work in that space where, you know, you're trying to create beautiful music, um, whatever your particular version of is, you, you become really, you know, hyper-focused on all the sounds that are, that are around the piece that you're working on. But, um, but no, I've, I've met people that have perfect pitch, and I was like, I'm, I'm kind of glad I don't have it because I'm annoyed by the pitch I have at times. Hmm. I'm glad for it, what? but, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, you carry with you. One of the things I've noticed after playing more music uh, from the Mideast over the last 15 years is when you hear American bands or Western bands that try to imitate it, but they didn't learn those notes like the E sharp. They never actually learned it. So they just do this uh, kind of, I don't know, this melisma where they're going up and down and, and they're hoping, well, if I play from a D to an F, I'm going to hit everything in between. So it kind of sounds right. But the difference between thinking you can imitate it and learning it, is the person that learned it will actually make a point to hit those notes. Even if they are just doing a gliss up to a note and down, they'll make a distinction of taking just a little extra time on the right notes. Um, so it sounds like that makam or that daska or raga. Whereas the Western ear, since we don't know where it is, we're just going to, you know, kind of mumble through it. Yeah. That drives me a little nuts. Um, that, that, Catches so, my ear. so you should really either learn to do it properly or, or don't do it. Don't try to. Well, to, to in my it. opinion, it's disrespectful. Yeah. You, you know, the, the culture that they, they've, they've learned this music over thousands of years. So you could spend 20 minutes a day for a couple of weeks. If you want to do a recording and get those extra notes, like just, it doesn't take so long to at least learn the note. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you want to sing the note or ask your guy in the studio <laughs> to look it up on Google Right. And then make sure you, you fix a pitch at that. Then I, I, I would be happy either way. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to circle back to a very, very ambitious project that you worked on a couple of years ago. And you were writing like a different song, like every, you were writing like a song a week in a different time signature. 
Mm -hmm. And so did you blow through every single time signature ever created by man or beast or, or no, <laughs> you know, that, um, no, because, well, no, the last I don't we think left off, you were at 52, seven or something, something I can't no, remember. I mean, I keep the denominators to normal numbers, like four, eight, oh, okay. one, okay. you know, uh, 16, stuff like that. I mean, sometimes I would use something over 16, I uh, knew 16 notes to have the pulse, but yeah, I did it. And I made it through all 52. Uh, it was really fun. And the thing I learned really from doing it is while it's crazy for me and it, it sounds crazy for a Westerner, when I've been playing now some Indian music, they'll take these 64 beat cycles and divvy them up into there's four groups of five, then some threes, then a couple twos, then one group of six. And then, you know, and then there's one at some point. So the accents are all over the place and they've been doing that since, you know, when they start learning at age seven to 10. And then I thought, Oh, huh, I still, I felt like as cool as I thought it was, I thought I actually have so much further to go. So it really opened my eyes to a lot, opened my ears to a lot. And I feel like there's, that's really just a nice beginning into acknowledging that there's so much I need to learn about time signature. So that was the biggest takeaway for you in, in that by, by doing this exercise, you learned that there was a whole nother b bunch of chapters or another book for you. Yeah. To open. yeah. You know, I played with a Sarod player and he was saying, let's play in seven and a half, eight. And I laughed and said, there's no such thing. Come on. And he said, no, really there is. You play seven eighth notes and then one sixteenth note. And then that's your measure. Wow. And it took me a little bit, but I got it. I mean, it's kind of like 15 over 16, really. It's the same. But it's, no, it's really seven and a half, seven and a half. It's pretty cool. I, I did a recording that year, 2015, just of me playing drum set with that. But I never got to write a track to it. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe that'll be something I do in the next year. Are you still playing drums often? I do. I uh, played this morning, yeah. but I didn't play drum set. I played cajon and some doom uh, but I do play drum set and I love playing drum set. I, actually, my first gig in Turkey was playing at a biker bar in Antalya and we played like, I don't know, Doobie Brothers and... Uh, I was going to say Steppenwolf. It just flashed Maybe. into my mind. <laughs> I mean, it was cool. I'm playing with these rugged, you know, older rockers with their Harleys outside. And I thought, man, this is an interesting life. If you asked me a year ago, would I be playing in a biker bar in Turkey, <laughs> playing drum set? I would have said, are you crazy? Yeah. No way. So I like to be open to life. I mean, you get a nice opportunity in life. I mean, I mean if it doesn't hurt anyone, sure, yeah. you know. That Thank is you. amazing. Hey, uh, I want to play this next one. And before I go into this, it's called Phoenix. And um, these, these are live performances. Is this, what is the, um, where were you playing this? Was this in Phoenix or is this just the title of, of the track? Um, can you play a couple of seconds? Sure. Let me just see here. <laughs> So that was a piece that's also not one I wrote, but uh, it, it was something our group did. Um, that piece is with Sarod, Rabab, and Doombeck. That was at a, our inaugural show in 2010. Uh, had a great Sarod player, Anupam Shavakar, and the Rabab player was Kais Esar, and Doombeck was a woman named Alyssa Nova. And it was a fusion of three three. Uh, traditions coming together uh, the Indian music of the Sarod, the Afghan music of the Rabab, and then the Mideast uh, traditions of the Dumbek. So, from an American perspective, sometimes we might have a hard time. There's kind of America and then the rest of the world. But what you might, I, I guess, in, in America, it might not seem such a big deal to put those three together. But if you go to Afghanistan or you went to the Mideast and you just showed that, that, those people, the people of that culture would be like, well, and, oh, amazing. We don't do this. We don't put this with this, you know? So it was, uh, and it was an experiment. Uh, the three people were open to it. I think they learned a lot from it. They liked it. But each of them at the end, because they're all very serious musicians, they said, mm, it's good, but it's not, it's not right. It's not, you know, my style. It was in the very beginning stages of Pangean. 
So and let's take let's take a listen, then then we'll talk further about it. So for uh, so we're gonna call it Phoenix for now, and here we go. It's the Pangean Orchestra.
So they were all wrong because the crowd loved it. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, I know what you're saying. A bit picky I know what after. you're saying. It's almost like you take somebody who is, you know, studied the cello and went to Berkeley and put in like 20 years and and said, you know, hey, play, you know, some 50s rock song, and they feel they're not. That's not really proper for the, what they've done. What they've put put into their instrument and their training. Yeah, I mean, musicians are we're a funny bunch. Like sometimes we purposely don't want to play the songs that the audience wants, uh, which is, I mean, a marketing nightmare, yeah, right. right? You're not playing the song that everyone will jump up and start chanting with. Um, so that's a little funny, but you know, I think the audience responded to the nature of the performance. I mean, everyone had an open heart going into it. Um, but when your reputation is such that you're a great classical player of one tradition, and that tradition tends to be pretty strict. You're, you are embarrassed. Like, oh, I, I played it this way. I, I would never do that in a traditional Indian concert. But it's not an Indian concert. It's an open fusion concert. So it's cool. It's right. okay. So it seems like you are, you know, you're kind of a leading force and that you have to, I'm not saying train them, but sort of educate them to say, you got to be open to this. It's like a, you're here because we love when, what you do and we respect what you do. But um, but you have to respect the vision, which is the Pangene Orchestra. It's like us interacting and, and learning from one another and seeing what we come up with, you know. Yeah, and I think part of that challenge is just the, the, the Western pop bands that have exploited the sounds of some of these countries. And they exploited it to make a top 40 hit and they made a bunch of money and... And now that culture looks like all they do is this pop music or that the people think the only way to be respected is to play this pop thing. And that's not what I'm saying. I don't mind pop music. I'll play a pop song. I'll play a song that makes the crowd clap. I'm not, you know, that doesn't bother me. Uh, but I will also always make a point in the show to say, if you liked this, you know, check them out here or I give them a chance to speak in their own language and play a song, a solo, say four or five minutes, just them unadulterated, unmixed, uh, because it's a, it's a definite fear and it's a legitimate fear that you're going to lose some of your identity by assimilating. You know, you have to give up 10% of yourself to make it with everyone else. Yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, what is the I, best way to be respected as a musician and a creator, in your opinion? The best way is to know before you speak to the person, know at least some things about their style of music, do a little bit of homework. It's probably like being a great host for this show. You do your research and then the person feels, oh, you listened to that? Wow, I'm flattered. Yeah. And as long, it's like learning Turkish. When I begin to speak some Turkish, the people think, oh, I took the time to learn this, that's respectful. And then they become more friendly. Oh, yeah, he did this. So just I, know. I agree with that. I mean, even if like, if I'm traveling to another country, I will learn to say good morning and the things that are at least polite, you know, maybe. Yeah, I, I try you know. to, I, my strategy is, you know, you learn the basics, the hello, the goodbye, yes, no. And then just learn like one kind of funny thing, like yeah. an yeah. odd phrase that you probably shouldn't know, but just learn this one funny thing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, yeah, that's my strategy with that. And with musicians, it's similar. Like, I will try to find out who the top people are. I can ask them ahead of time, who's your hero for the instrument? And then listen to it. You know, you don't, they're not expecting you to be an expert. I can't, no one can be an expert on every instrument. Right. But if you at least know what scales they play or what meter it plays in, just know something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. then, then, you know, then they're really uh, nice. And, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm fortunate. I, I've always been spending my life since I was 10 or 11 learning weird musics and stuff. So now that I'm kind of old, uh, that's a lot of years. And so a lot of the time I can naturally speak to people from different countries about their music um, and go pretty in depth because I'm, I'm like a kid and I'm giddy and excited about it. But an instrument I don't know, I, I put in like as much time as I can yeah. to learn. And it's a lot because there's so many instruments. And speaking of instruments and, and different people, 
uh, that have tremendous command over these instruments and have dedicated their life to learn them. How do you stay connected to so many people um, with such a diverse skills? Is there, um, you know, is there a dialogue that happens often as far as even just, you know, sort of business, but even socially that you, you've, you've gotten to know these people through, you know, years of, of building this thing? How does that go, or do you just go like when there's a when there's a gig, then we we get together? Um, do you stay like like hooked up with them in any way? Um, generally, because the experiences are very intimate and special moments, um, I generally pretty naturally keep relationships with the people that have done it. I mean, generally, when you're doing your career, say traditional Irish music. And then you do one of these world fusion shows. It's generally one of the things at the end of the year you'll remember. Um, and so a lot of times, yeah, I've made some great friendships and uh, with people from different countries and, you know, musicians really are, we have a lot, of, we have a lot in common for all the differences that you can see superficially with the scales or the meter. There's basically a connection in that, we're manipulating sound and we're doing it in a way that our spirit and our heart vibrate in a good way. And we're trying to project that to others. So we really have the same job it, we're, and we're speaking the same language. We're just, you know, doing it with different accents and different dialects, but it's the same language. And I've found so many things in common, whether it's music of Turkey and the musicians themselves, or if it's hip hop music, uh, whatever we, we kind of, I don't know. We're kind of a cool bunch of people to hang out with and fun. You know, Irish traditional guys are awesome. And I guess I have a way to maybe segment it in my brain where I know, okay, these are these guys and this is what we did. This is what they do. And I know how to talk this way, but I'm pretty much just myself. I don't BS that much. So there's not a lot to remember. Yeah. Which is great because I forget just about everything. <laughs> that's that's good. So, they say you know if you if you, you, you the people who don't lie have no memory because there's no need for it. <laughs> yeah, I would be a really bad one because I would, I forget. Oh, I forget where I put my phone at least six times a day. Yeah. So I do story, with my glasses. Yeah. Let me ask you, why did you end up in Turkey of all places? Why was what was the pull that that brought you there? That you you ended up spending so much time there. Well, it was a really rough time in my life. It was in 2017. I'd been divorced. And then there was a weird child. Uh, uh, the way the parenting structure is I have a couple months on, a couple months off. Okay. The children are, we're moving to another state. I was writing music for TV and I was doing it via the internet. And I had some really good, like you were just asking actually about the connection. How do you stay connected? I played in a Turkish band in 2000. 2003 uh in american they, we were in america but it was a turkish uh, music band and we were like brothers and they said well come to turkey man and like i said earlier if you get a great opportunity and life just kind of gives you this option it doesn't hurt anyone take it so i went and i didn't speak turkish when i went there um but i loved it it was a little resort town called kushadasa it turned out to be the first uh city i got a commission from the government there to write music for chamber orchestra and things just really took off uh, from there. So I was just open, you know, the cliche is about the door closing and another opens like, yeah, this one, the ideal, whatever is done, but now, Hey, there's this other option. Life's not over. It's just different, you know? Yeah. So it turned out to be a fantastic move for me. And yes, a lot of people think you're crazy. Why are you going to Turkey? But the Turkish people have been so good to me, so kind. I feel safe there. I, I like it very much. I like the culture. I like the way of life. I walk everywhere. The food is very healthy <laughs> compared to the American diet. So I like that. I don't know. Nice. Good choice. Good choice. Let's play this one here. This is, this is um, it's called closing on this track. And, and again, I want to talk a little bit about the recording of, of what you guys do live. Here we go.
Now this one sounds a little like, sounds like a little bit of hip hop, Eastern hip hop. I've been wanting to have a turntable with the Pangean Orchestra since the inception of it. I feel like it's one of the coolest uh, instruments to come along in a long time. And it, it's so, the, the creativity of a turntable is infinite, what people can do on it. Uh, so we were really lucky. We had a DJ named DJ Action and I wanted to do Run's House. Uh, and because we always put one drum feature in a concert. So uh, I said, well, let's do Run's House. I've always wanted since I was, you know, 10, I bought the tougher than leather tape. You know, I, I could do this. And so we did. And then he mixed in some samples from some other tunes. And oh, man, so fun. So fun. So when you're doing this, when you're doing these creations, how does this work? I mean, do you guys come in early? For, because it's so difficult to get um, all these people assembled uh, as a full orchestra, um, unless you're gigging somewhere. So is it, does that happen like during like rehearsal or do you just get together with a couple of people to, to vet out some ideas for, for future um, um, pieces of music that you're going to create? So, yeah, generally there's a little like mastermind group kind of thing. You know, we've got a, a few like a nucleus yeah. and we test out and you have representatives of different traditions and we'll try stuff out and then from there it's up to that little group to sell it to everyone else that this is a good idea and you know not everything is not everything is worked out it's art so sometimes you can have a great piece sometimes eh, it didn't it just didn't come together for some reason and you can kind of look back later at the tape and find out why why did this not go uh, so yeah we generally I do come up with ideas at first and then I bring it to that small group of people and then from there we find out what was good and what was me just being crazy for today and then we'll then sell it to the rest of the group as okay now we need some buy-in and then you get when you have the full rehearsal uh, now you've got everyone involved and people will say well either my instrument doesn't do this maybe we can play it this way or can we change the key or can we what about playing it, you know, in this other feel or different vibe altogether? So it's kind of fun. It's really like a science lab, you know, going into some rehearsals. You have an idea and a hypothesis, but when you get there and you mix the little solutions together, sometimes there's an explosion or sometimes there's yeah. unexpected stuff. So it's really pretty fun. Uh, it's a group creative process. When uh, you've you've done some work for music, television, film, things like that, um, how do you get your um, how do you get the attention put on the creations you make? Um, are you doing all the hustle on that? Do you have any help? Like you know, because it's uh, again, it's more time, it's more sweat, it's more it's more work to get your your sound out there like every other musician goes through. You're just doing it on a much you know, larger level with a whole orchestra. So what's your process for reaching people? Is it you just picking up the phone or is it people coming to you that know about what you guys are doing? In the beginning, it was a lot of looking up community organizations, temples, churches, uh, like that, that uh, help certain parts of the, the community refugee groups, um, different things like that, and talking to their directors, talking to the people. So in the beginning, it was a lot of just me. It was just me um, doing all of that. And to a large extent now, recruiting is still mostly on my shoulders. But now that we have some other people extremely enthused, they start to tell their friends, and it has gotten a bit easier. In Turkey especially, we had one uh, we had one get together gathering in December of last year. And after that, there was so much buzz and excitement that the musicians themselves started doing recruiting for the group, like telling their friends, yo, you really need to come and see this guy. You really need to uh, come and play and just see what else is there. So, so that helps changed. the, the crowdfunding efforts as well as just, you know, organically helping your brand grow. Ideally, yeah. ideally it should. Yeah. Um, what is what is the uh, the next mission for you and and the project as far as um, are you guys going to be just continually 
hopscotching around the world? Do you guys have like a schedule together, or how, you know, how's it gonna how's it gonna go over the next well, say, year? So the orchestra is not uh, hasn't been easy to to move. Yeah. Um, myself, I will go, and I feel that there's more learning. I feel like if you're going to be the leader, it's uh, the onus is on you to learn, and you to if you're going to lead, you should know things. Uh, so me personally, I need to grow. Uh, so next month I'm going to places and studying music that I don't know well. Uh, there's an instrument in Japan called the biwa, which I love. I've loved it every time I've seen it and heard it. And I don't know anything about it. It's just like the Chinese pipa, which I've played with for 20 years. But the biwa, they use a, a pick that looks like the, the one kind of comb. Oh, so and, the, and the repertoire is different. So the attack and the way they play is totally different repertoire is different uh the scales are different and so i'm really really happy to be meeting two biwa players in japan uh dj in japan to just um you know different music styles and what they're doing there's a lot of really fantastic things coming out of that country and that city and then korea i don't know much about their instruments i know that they're very similar to the instruments of china uh which i i ran a chinese orchestra in america for two years and I know how they're played, but I don't know the repertoire. I don't know their way of attack, their approach. And I want to learn that. And then finally, Mongolia. I'll be going to Mongolia and they have some of the coolest instruments in the world. Just breathtakingly beautiful to look at. They're enchanting to listen to. They're singers uh, from Tuvan. Uh, they they sing with the the multiphonic sounds in their their vocal cords. Oh right, yeah. And they're just so cool. And even the Mongolian rockers are cool. And so I'll be going there. I'm ex I'm excited to be recording my. I'll be recording in the Gobi Desert. Uh, I'll be right. I play Native American flutes, and I'll be bringing some flutes with me. A very portable keyboard, and I look forward to be just inspired by nature out there. Uh, and then I'll come back to Turkey and I'll decompress. And from there, we'll start looking at a new season, new new music for Pangean. So the rest of the year is booked for you. It sounds like you've got a lot going on. Yeah, I'll be traveling quite a bit and learning a lot. I feel like I always got to be learning. Yeah. I always got to be pushing myself. Fabulous. Okay, best way that our audience can support the Pangean Orchestra and you, Colin. Um, your website looks great, by the way. Should we just put people over to your website or where is the best place? I think that'll be the most enduring way. Uh, okay. You know, assuming people will be listening to this in perpetuity. Yes. If they go to pangeanorchestra.com, it's the onus is on us to make sure the link's there if you want to support us. And then following us is easy on Instagram and Facebook with the links. I'm sure you sure will have it. On Instagram, it's the Pangean Orchestra, and is it? Yeah, and then Facebook is Pangean Orchestra, and myself, I do lots of projects as well. Pangean is the, is a big one, but I do other shows and things as well. So World Maestro is my name and my website, WorldMaestro.com, World Maestro on Instagram and and Facebook. I have those up right now. Great, great looking. Uh, the photos are great. Everything, the information is awesome on there. So. Folks, please support Colin O'Donohoe and the Pangean Orchestra and all the projects that he's working on. And Colin, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, to see what you're doing. I think you're just a great guy, a great father, such a talent, and you're doing things that no one else on this planet is doing that I know of. <laughs> Thanks. And, you know, maybe there's listeners that play some of these styles of music and didn't think there was an outlet. So certainly your listeners are also very welcome to contact me and I'd love to know what they're doing. So Awesome. Colin, always a pleasure to have you on the Dharmic Evolution. Uh, just want to wish you all of God's blessings on you and your children and all of your musical uh, aspirations, my friend. Thanks. I wish the same to you. Mahmoudi. Phoenix. And the closing. These are the songs and the orchestrations of Colin O'Donohoe and the Pangean Orchestra. You know, at the end of that Phoenix, it sounded a little intense, almost like Baba O'Reilly from The Who. <laughs> and uh, in closing, I heard this sound, this swirling, almost like somebody was whipping swords through the air. I forgot to ask Colin about that. I'll have to catch up to him next time. Please support 
Colin O'Donohoe and the Pangean Orchestra. You can go over to um, worldmaestro.com. All of the links are in the show notes to reach out. Check out these guys on Vimeo or their videos, um, their songs, their orchestrations. And you can also go over to indiegogo.com forward slash projects forward slash the Pangean Orchestra. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. It was great catching up with Colin. Please support them. Um, Indie music is so important, and this especially is very important as it's bringing people together from all cultures, all over the world, all type of instruments that most of us have never even heard of a lot of these instruments. So very, very exciting. If you haven't done so yet, head over to the Dharmic Evolution Facebook community page. If you've got a new album out, a new EP, a new song, um, a new photo shoot, maybe you're playing a bunch of gigs somewhere, you're touring, or you're just doing a one night, let us know where it is. Let us know what's going on so we can support you all over the world. I don't care where you are. You may be in Tunisia with termites in your house. We want to know. If you're an author, speaker, thought leader, you've got a new book out, are you doing a presentation somewhere? Let us know about that. You can post on there as well. We'd love to hear from you guys. And if you haven't checked out the Dharmic Evolution uh, website, please check it out. There's a whole bunch of new content on there, a new player. It's really banging, as a lot of people have been telling me about. And also thank you, special shout out to those of you who have been downloading my new ebook, uh, it's all about how to battle depression. There's seven tips in there, one for each day of the week. You can check it out on James Kevin O'Connor Music on Facebook. That's it for me today. That's the wrap. I'm your host for the Dharmic Evolution, James Kevin O'Connor, singer, songwriter, audio video artist, master storyteller, and international talent agent. So until the next time, when we meet again, I'll either see you on the socials or I'll see you from the stage.